Anybody can take a payment over the phone. Brandy Baggett works hard, days at an eye clinic, nights waiting tables. Hey guys, how are y'all doing? She also works hard putting her life back together. It came unraveled soon after she met Paul Ireland last year. I mean, everything that you would want in a guy, that's what he was. He was sweet and, I don't know, he was just perfect. Brandy and Ireland began dating. He did things like open the door for me and pull my chair out and do things like that that I wasn't used to. But about six months into the relationship, Ireland's behavior started to change. He didn't want me talking to certain people anymore. Um, I had to get rid of some of my friends to make him happy. I wasn't allowed to go and hang out with my friends anymore. Um, and just stuff like that got worse and worse. Brandy says for a while she just brushed off some of Ireland's behavior, even made excuses for it, hoping things would get better. There was a point in time where I wasn't even allowed to go to my mother's house without him being there with me. Um, I wasn't allowed to talk to her on the phone without him being beside me where he could hear what I was saying. I felt like I was, I was his puppet. There was, I mean, I couldn't make any decisions on my own. Everything had to be, you know, with his approval and it's just, it's miserable. We were arguing one day and I was, upset, I was crying, and I asked him, um, I said, am I going to have to live the rest of my life like this? And he pushed me back on the bed and had his hand around my neck and he said, bitch, I'll take your life. There were times where I really honestly thought the only way to get out of this was to get out of it dead. I just, whether it would be from me killing myself or from him killing me, that was the only way out. I didn't know what to do. Um, I was scared and I didn't know how to handle it, so it took me a really long time to finally decide to make a move to try to get out of the relationship. And he ended up raping me that morning and so that was when I said that that was it. I, was, I had to get out of it one way or another. Brandy went to a neighbor's home. They told her to call the Pitt County Sheriff's Office. Deputies charged Ireland with rape. Brandy took out a domestic violence protection order to try and keep Ireland away from her. I knew how he was and I knew that that piece of paper was not going to stop him from getting to me if that's what he really wanted. The order didn't stop Ireland. He began stalking Brandy. One day as she was driving to work, he pulled up beside her at a stoplight. He just stopped like right beside my car and looked me dead in the eyes and then he sat there for a few seconds and then drove off again. He had showed up at my job one time. Um, trying to get me to talk to him and my manager ended up telling him that he had to leave. I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect because I had never like been through anything like this before and I didn't know exactly how far he would go. So I didn't know what to expect and that's what scared me the most. Brandy had been staying with family and friends but one Sunday night she decided to go home. I felt like I would be okay if I just went home that night. I'm, I knew I had to work the next morning, so I thought, you know, I'll just be there for a little while, go to work. The next morning as she was getting ready for work, she heard a truck pull up outside. As soon as I saw that it was him, I locked the door, I locked the deadbolt and the regular lock, and I ran to um, the back of the house where the, the bookshelf is. As she hid behind the bookshelf, Ireland kicked in the door. He put one arm around my waist and picked me up and carried me out the door. Ireland forced Brandy into the truck. And then that's when I noticed that he had two guns with him. It definitely scared me because it's it was one thing for him to, you know, force me out of the house, but then to know that he had guns, I like I I didn't think that I was gonna I thought once the truck left the yard that I wasn't ever gonna come back. Neither did John Guard. He's with the domestic violence unit at the Pitt County Sheriff's Office. Guard was one of the first to arrive at Brandy's house after he received a report that she hadn't shown up for work. He remembers seeing her kicked in door. I mean, my heart sunk when I, I saw that. I mean, there was, you know, there, it's just, it wasn't good. I felt like, uh, you know, the, the next, I mean, this was just the beginning of what was gonna be a murder. Guard says Brandy's case is textbook of how so many cases lead to violence. This case really exposes what victims of domestic violence face long before the first push and shove. You don't expect someone you love and care about to be harmful to you. Rebecca Macy says that's why victims often miss or even ignore those early indicators of an abusive relationship. 
Macy, who is a domestic violence researcher at the UNC School of Social Work, says the subtle signs can be hard to read. Say I'm dating a guy and he says, he calls me to say, hey, you haven't shown up back at your house yet, or I'm trying to find you, where are you? That could be care and concern, or it could be someone who really is laying the groundwork that wants to control me and really wants to know my whereabouts all the time. Often an abuser's efforts to control and isolate the victim escalate into verbal and psychological abuse and ultimately into physical violence. You know, it started off really well. This was a loving relationship and there was a lot of positives to this, but then the violence started and then it got worse. Macy says sometimes hope keeps victims in the relationship. There's a lot of hope that it could be better, that the violence could end um, rather than the relationship. And sometimes fear is the motivator. I think sometimes when women hesitate to end a relationship, it's because of, of fear of making things worse. And I think that that's a valid fear. Next, some innovative efforts underway to help keep victims safe and hold abusers accountable. He's showing to not be where he's supposed to be. And later, we'll show you how Brandy Baggett managed to escape from Paul Ireland and the message she has for others like her. Get out early. He's showing to not be where he's supposed to be. Sergeant Chad Clark is in the electronic monitoring unit of the Pitt County Sheriff's Office. He's showing us how people arrested on domestic violence charges are monitored electronically while out on bond. We're constantly monitoring, looking at, seeing what's going on with, with everybody. This cuff is waterproof and take a shot with it, that's no problem. An electronic monitoring bracelet is placed on an offender's ankle. It sends out a signal that allows deputies to trace the offender's movement on a laptop computer in their cars or on a desktop computer in their offices. We had the availability to pull up the location of where they are at any given time. The green zones indicate where offenders are supposed to be at certain times, like work or home. The red zones are where they're not supposed to be, like the homes or workplaces of their victims. If they enter into any of these red zones, it sends out an automatic, immediate alert. When an alert goes out, deputies contact both the offender and the victim and begin moving toward the offender's location. When offenders are in locations where they are not supposed to be, it can be a violation of their pretrial release conditions and they can be sent to jail. It holds offenders accountable and gives victims some peace of mind. They understand that it is not a fail-safe program. They understand this, but it does give them an added sense of security knowing that the offender is being monitored, is being tracked, is being watched. Electronic monitoring is just one way the Pitt County Sheriff's Office is focusing on the time period between an offender's arrest and their trial. Guard says historically, law enforcement agencies have ended their investigation of a domestic violence case after leaving the scene. We investigate the case. If there's probable cause, if that exists, we make the arrest, but we really turn on the, the heat after the arrest because we're looking at what's happening after that 911 call after the arrest but before adjudication. Guard says that's when most offenders try to manipulate the system. They tell victims every day not to go to court and when they don't go to court a lot of times those cases get dismissed. They escape accountability and then we as a society, we blame the victim because she didn't show up. Guard has many examples, like this call from an offender to his victim. Whatever happens, don't ever show back up in court no more. I don't care what they tell you, what they promise you, just don't ever go back no more. Now, without you, they can't find me guilty. If Guard's domestic violence unit discovers that sort of victim intimidation, it will file more charges against the offender. You still can't have any contact with her. And if any conditions of the offender's pre-trial release are violated, his unit will try to get the offender put back in jail under a higher bond. If you do, your bond's going to be set at like 50000 The unit also obtained statements from friends and neighbors of the victim as evidence in case the victim decides not to testify. Can we all agree domestic violence is a pattern. The aggressive and innovative way the Pitt County Sheriff's Office investigates domestic violence cases has Guard doing presentations and training for other law enforcement agencies around the state. 40% of all mass killings come out of the context of domestic violence. It's also earned the county federal funding for its domestic violence protection efforts. We haven't been stagnant. We've always asked why. Why is this occurring and trying to adapt to change and, and respond accordingly. 
In September, Pitt County became one of only four communities in the country to share in a two and a half million dollar federal grant for domestic violence prevention. In Pitt County, that money will be used to deploy something called the Lethality Assessment Program, or LAP, and gather data to determine its effectiveness. Based off the situation that occurred today, I want to ask you a series of questions and offer you some assistance. LAP is already being used by the Cary Police Department. It's a set of 11 questions that an officer asks a victim when responding to a domestic violence call. Has he ever threatened to kill you or your children? Yes. Those questions help us determine what victims are at the greatest risk and the greatest danger for being killed by their intimate partner so that we can try to get them um, services as soon as possible and hopefully try to help them break that cycle. Since it started using LAP, Cary Police say more victims are getting help through domestic violence agencies like Raleigh's Interact. It's incredibly effective. <laughs> Pitt County's federal grant is to document and quantify that effectiveness. Rebecca Macy will gather and examine data on LAP's use in the county with a key question in mind. Can we replicate LAP other places and can we produce similar outcomes? Based off the situation that occurred today, I'm concerned for your safety. I'd LAP like is just one more weapon in the war against domestic violence. Many say to win the war, everyone needs to join the fight. So if you're at church or you're at work and someone tells a sexist joke or a rape joke or a domestic violence joke, you don't just let it sit there, you actively challenge that and say, you know, I'm not comfortable with that or, hey, that's not cool. You know, we as a society, we need to change. Let's not set the bar at what is criminal behavior. It's as simple as what's right and wrong. And it's wrong way before it's criminally wrong. We need to say it's, it's all about good relationships. It's building good relationships. Next, a local program that's helping abusers build better relationships and stop the cycle of abuse. Because I've already caused a lot of damage. And a Raleigh man who says it works. Everyone has the right to not be abused. I don't want to be, you know, the, the bad husband or the bad father or, you know, the guy who's in jail. Edward Cummings was certainly heading down that path, a path that began a very long time ago. I never really knew my parents. He was just three years old when his father murdered his mother and aunt. And, and my father, he's been in prison 30 years now. Cummings was placed with his grandmother. I started getting in trouble and things like that. So it was off to foster homes. They literally moved me everywhere. I'd stay in a place a few months and then they'd move me somewhere else. He went to court to be legally emancipated at the age of 16. I dropped out of school, started working full time everywhere I could, anywhere I could. And any state he could until he moved back to Raleigh in 2008. And a year later, uh, I met my wife um, and we've been together ever since. But he found out something was missing. Not having the knowledge that a lot of people gained through growing up with a stable family for years and years. It caused problems and trust and communication. I didn't know exactly how to go about um, expressing myself, you know, other than that basic instinct to, you know, when you're mad, you know, grab something, hit something. And so things didn't go well when Cummings and his wife got into an argument when he came home late after a night of partying with friends. We went from that to pushes and shows. I left the house that night and, you know, my wife, uh, you know, being fearful, uh, she called the police. Cummings was charged with assault on a female. It was a serious lapse in judgment. It was me creating a, a hostile environment. Passive and passive aggressive. As part of his sentence, Cummings had to attend a 26 week behavior modification program run by Raleigh's Triangle Family Services called DOSE. It stands for Developing Opportunities for a Safe Environment. Yesterday I had court for the restraining order. The program teaches clients to recognize the patterns of abusive behavior. A lot is based on their upbringing, based on their um, culture sometimes, and based on um, just behaviors that have been accepted by people around them, enablers. DOSE gives their clients tools to deal with their behavior. That's coupled with group therapy sessions where clients can encourage and support one another. And so there's really this dynamic that works that helps them relate and interrelate with each other to help try the tools out, learn the tools, apply the tools, and share the tools. What we hear in our clients often is, I wish somebody would have given me this information back in middle school. It's going to be all right, man. But the first step in the program is accountability. They've got to own 
their behavior. They've got to recognize that what they did was um, domestic violence, was family violence. Cummings says Dose helped him become a better man. Giving me techniques that calm me down from being so hot-headed or from being, you know, so stubborn, rather than, you know, getting verbal or physical or, you know, emotional um, and, and, you know, lashing out or, or having a problem. He says it's helped his marriage. There's more communication now. As well before, it was more of an argument thing. Um, now, after the, the communication, after the discussion, we're able to come to, you know, peaceful solutions to whatever the problems may be or, or for whatever we're talking about. It, it gives you something to, you know, wake up and go to bed to be happy about. Next, Brandy Baggett's own search for happiness after her experience in an abusive relationship. Just getting to a point in my life where I can, you know, sleep at night without having to worry about anything. To learn more about the WRL documentary, Enough is Enough, or if you need help and are looking for resources, go to WRL.com and type WRL Doc in the search box. When Paul Ireland kidnapped Brandy Baggett from her Pitt County home in October of 2013, he took her to Northampton County. He put a lot of effort into to not being caught. For five days, he held her at a couple of abandoned homes owned by his family. I honestly thought that when he took me there that he would end up killing me and then killing himself. But Brandy had a plan. I did my best to convince him that I wanted to be with him again and um, that it was all a big mistake. I shouldn't have tried to leave him and that it was my fault. I took the blame for everything. Um, and I told him that I want, like, I just, I loved him and I wanted to be with him and I wanted to try to make things work. Ireland was convinced. He asked Brandy to call Pitt County Sheriff to explain. I heard fear. I heard um, probably intimidation. I heard she was very fearful in her voice, but she was trying to really act like everything was fine, but she was doing a terrible job at it. Ireland decided to have his grandmother drive Brandy to the sheriff's office. The plan was to go back and for me to tell the sheriff that I wanted to drop all the charges and that I wanted to be with him, um, that he didn't do anything wrong. Ireland even wrote a script for her. He told her to transcribe it so it would be in her own handwriting. I love him and I want all of this to go away. A lot seems to be misunderstood. He has not hurt me, threatened me, or harmed me in any way. Paul's a good guy and is not guilty of a lot of what he has been charged with. I want what he has been charged with dropped and do not plan on appearing in court. As soon as she walks in, she no longer is the same person we've been talking to on this phone. She just broke down and started telling us the truth. I just never would have predicted, and nobody else would have, that she would have been released. That's because Brandy's case reminded guard of Anitra Coburn. Coburn's case was profiled in the award-winning 2006 WRL documentary, Paper Thin Promise. Carter kidnapped Anitra and eventually took her to her grandparents' trailer in Franklin County. Coburn's boyfriend kidnapped her from her Pitt County home and murdered her after holding her hostage for a week. Hello? What's the matter? What's the matter? Doug? 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 There were a lot of similarities to this case and to the case uh, involving a nature of Coburn. Coburn's boyfriend tried to kill himself but failed and was sentenced to life in prison. Paul Ireland shot and killed himself hours after releasing Brandy. I cried really, really hard. I wanted him to get help. I didn't want it to just, I wasn't looking to just save myself. I wanted to save him too. Brandy says she takes anxiety medication, receives counseling, and gets a lot of support from friends. She's working to save money to go to nursing school and says she has learned from her experience. I learned definitely what to look for um, to keep that from happening again. Um, and just, you have to be careful who you trust. You, you just have to really, really be careful. You guys doing okay over here? Do you need refills or anything? Appreciate it. All right, you're welcome. And when signs of a potentially abusive relationship appear? Get out early because the earlier you get out, the easier it's going to be. Um, if, you, if you wait around, you're just going to wait till it's too late. 
instead of just, you know, brushing it off, pushing it to the side, you know, making excuses, I could have gotten out while I was still, you know, before it got really bad. It makes you a lot more cautious and it also makes you a lot more thankful for, you know, what you have and for just being alive.